Uh, before, before I start, I just want to make a couple of shout outs to people who are here with us today. Um, Helena is just gone, but I, I should point out that she has been one of the um, uh, biggest and most um, effective advocates in the House of Lords and in, in general parliamentary circles for a UK Magnitsky Act. And we probably wouldn't have had it had it not been her for her stalwart advocacy. Um, I see Jeffrey Robertson QC um, on this call. I don't think he's speaking, but I see him attending. Jeffrey Robertson <clears throat> has been for 10 years my partner in advocating for the Magnitsky Act. And we're almost at the point of having an Australian Magnitsky Act and um, his credibility and gravitas um, uh, and testimony and uh, legal work um, uh, has made that possible in, in, in addition to various other places. I see, um, I, we don't know each other, Amanda, but uh, Human Rights First um, uh, is an incredible organization who are responsible for a third of all US Magnits global Magnitsky sanctions. And, and um, it's uh, with a model that they've created needs to be replicated around the world. And then we also have the Italian Helsinki Commission who's been very helpful. And I know a number of your representatives. So I just wanted to shout out to all of, all of people who have been helpful to us in our campaign. Um, I'm probably the only non-lawyer on this call. Um, and, and perhaps that's been an advantage in coming up with the idea of Magnitsky sanctions. All of you lawyers um, uh, like to work within the law. And when, when Sergei Magnitsky was murdered um, in 2009, um, I wanted to get some, I wanted some type of redress for his, his killing. And I looked, and, and, and in Russia, because the Russian government killed him, um, and it was effectively a, a political killing, um, they weren't going to provide us with any justice inside of Russia. And so <clears throat> um, we said, how do we get justice outside of Russia? And I looked at all the mechanisms of justice. Um, and everyone said, you should go to the European Court for Human Rights. So we went to the European Court for Human Rights and discovered that um, they only issue judgments against a country, um, not against any individuals. Um, and that's, that was highly unsatisfactory since we know who the individuals were who killed Sergei and tortured him. Um, and, and, and by the way, it takes like eight years and, and in the end, um, the, 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 the best outcome is a 50,000 50, euro award for, for the family. And in, in our case, we got that judgment, got that award eight years later and they still haven't paid it. And so that's not justice. Um, I, I went to, um, to the International Criminal Court and uh, to the Chief Justice at the time, and I told him the story of Magnitsky, and he said, I'm sorry, you know, you need 100,000 dead, not one dead to, to get any kind of case here. Um, I looked at your universal jurisdiction, which is a concept that says that if, if a crime is so heinous um, that it can be, uh, even if there's not normally jurisdiction in a foreign country, it can be uh, tried in that foreign country. And, and there's lots of universal jurisdiction statutes on different books, but when it comes to reality, none of them ever get implemented. And so the, the best outcome in my case with Sergei Magnitsky's murder was to get statements from governments expressing their dissatisfaction. And I knew that that was gonna be meaningless in the case of Russia. And so I said, if we couldn't get justice, if, if there's no concept of justice, if there's no mechanism for justice, then we need to create one. And this is where my background as a business person comes in. I understood that the crimes that are committed, most crimes that are committed in Russia and other places um, are committed by people um, who are corrupt and they have money abroad and they value that money abroad. And, they, and as Helena said, when they all know that their regimes are eventually gonna come to an end. And when they do come to an end, they wanna flee abroad to like to the safety of the UK and they wanna have their money safe in the UK and other places. And, um, and that's when we came up with this idea, which is that if we could um, uh, freeze their assets and ban their travel, then these bad guys um, and women, for that matter, bad guys and bad women, um, wouldn't be able to uh, uh, to flee and wouldn't be able wouldn't have that security. And um, and we got that's that was the um, genesis for the Magnitsky Act, and the Magnitsky Act um, uh, started in the United States. The first version of the Magnitsky Act came in 2012, just for Russia. It was just a specific piece of legislation for Russia. And um, the moment after it was passed, 
Vladimir Putin went out of his mind and he banned the adoption of Russian orphans by American families. Um, and then he, he made it his single largest foreign policy priority um, to try to repeal the Magnitsky Act. And the two senators who were the main co-sponsors, Senator John McCain and Senator Benjamin Cardin, looked at each other and they said, well, wait a second, if, if Putin got so mad about this, um, then, then clearly other dictators will be equally mad about it. Why don't we broaden this out? And they introduced the Global Magnitsky Act and the Global Magnitsky Act was passed in uh, December of 2016. Uh, subsequent to that, actually on the same day as that, the Estonian parliament unanimously passed the Estonian Magnitsky Act. Um, in October of 2017, the um, Canadian Parliament, the House of Commons, and the Senate unanimously passed the Canadian Magnitsky Act, then the Lithuanians, then the Latvians, then the British. Um, and uh, we now have 31 countries with Magnitsky Acts, most recently with the European Union that passed it in, um, uh, in December. The, um, the most important thing about the Magnitsky Act is it works. Um, and we know it works from all sorts of anecdotal situations, but for this call, the most relevant one is it works in Turkey. Um, the US applied the Magnitsky, the Global Magnitsky Act in relation to a, uh, a, uh, an American pastor who had been uh, uh, wrongly imprisoned in Turkey. And they applied it towards the um, justice minister and the interior minister of Turkey. And within moments, after they applied it, um, Pastor Brunson was released. And um, it was, I, I, I think it was actually sort of badly applied in the sense that it shouldn't be used as a strategic tool, it should be used as a justice tool. Um, but be that as it may, the fact that it was applied to Turkey and it led to an immediate outcome gives you some sense um, of how important it would be um, in this case where instead of one person being released, you've got literally hundreds and hundreds of people unjustly uh, in prison that need to be released. In terms of where we are at the moment, as I mentioned, there are 31 countries, uh, 27 countries of the EU, um, uh, United States, Canada, uh, UK, um, and um, uh, uh, Kosovo, sorry. Uh, don't ask me why Kosovo, but Kos Kosovo is, is the other country. On deck, as I mentioned, we have Australia, um, Japan, New Zealand, and Taiwan. Um, I believe Australia is, is coming up uh, reasonably soon. And the most important um, thing to do now is to come up with very credible uh, evidence packages to submit uh, and I would argue to submit at the same time to all the countries, to all the main decision makers um, of terrible atrocities that have been committed and the evidence and names of the people who are involved in perpetrating those atrocities. That's how you get people on the Magnitsky list. And um, it may not be possible to do it for all 600 people that have been imprisoned, but I, my advice would be to pick out the really um, uh, obvious and most horrific cases and the ones with the best evidence and um, submit uh, the documents um, in unison to all the countries. And, and it's nice that we have the Human Rights First Representative Amanda here who maybe can talk about that, but that is the, um, uh, the, the key to that. And, and while submitting it, um, make it well known and publicize who you're asking to be sanctioned and um, what you're asking, what they did and what evidence you have. And just the conversation um, is, is often a sanction itself, uh, not to mention the actual results. And so I think I will leave it at that. I'm not gonna be able to participate for the full two hours, but, um, but I'll be here for the first hour if, if, uh, if I can be helpful. Thank you.